All right, you guys are awesome. We're going to have some fun. It's going to be great. It's going to be awesome and laugh and stuff. And some people, oh, a guest speaker. That's dope. I never saw it before. <laughs> I just saw my name. It's like right, it's like right here. Can I touch it? <laughs> hey, name. It's weird. I'm, I'm, oh, I disappeared. It doesn't, I don't like myself, apparently. <laughs> this is weird. So we're going to laugh this morning. It's going to be great. We're going to laugh and stuff. We're going to learn some stuff. It's going to be really cool and stuff. Um, so it's going to I'm doing math. So when I prepared for this service, I asked God a question. I said, what do you want me to tell them, specifically to you guys? And he said, um, I care about you. Like, so he just wants you to know that he, I know that seems like obvious because he's God, but he just wants you to know that he, he cares about you. Um, so... There's a lot of math going on in my head right now. So uh, Jeremiah 29, 11 is one of the verses we're going to refer to today. You know, you could just write it down. Later on, I think this will pop in a brand new way as a result of this. And then um, also John 10, 27, and then Revelations 3, 20. Those three verses, we're not going to read them today, but you should read them when you go home. And I think they'll pop in a new way as a result of what we do today. Um, all right. So I'm a, we're going to laugh. Some people think you shouldn't laugh in church. <laughs> My response is always, what good father doesn't want to hear his children's laughter in his house? So we get to laugh. It's going to be awesome. Hey, so somebody in this room has an amazing voice that God wants to use in a really significant way. And it's that lady right there who just looked at her husband. Yeah, you. What's your name? Chelsea. You have a significant voice that God wants to use. Have you heard that before? Do you know this? I was sitting back there in worship, and God was on my neck about you. That's why I was all fumbling just now up here. So what, is your, what, what song has God put on your heart? I'm just curious. Is, is there already a song that God has already put on your heart? What is it? Goal. I've never heard this song before. I don't even know what it is. But let's hear it. Can you hand her a microphone, please? So, so yeah, just you can give me a couple whatevers of it. But this is, this is I feel like, I don't, I don't know. I just feel like you... you, you, you I don't know all the words. It's okay. See, did you drop the mic before you got started? Is that what you just did? Like, you're supposed to wait till you're done and then drop it. But you're going to drop it ahead of time. It's okay. Look up the words. I feel like God is really wants you to um, set a tone right now. So you can just sing any part of it or, or, or just the whole whatever. Whatever you feel like right now because this is the last service. We got time. We'll work oh it out. Gosh. I'm freaking out. Really? No, yeah, like for real. <laughs> okay. Hey, here's what we'll do. Here, here's what we'll do. How you feeling? You good? You got, do I have to stand up? You don't have to stand up. You want to stay seated? Hey, you know what? I'll tell you what. Yes. Because <laughs> there's probably something heavy going on. You know what? I'll tell you what. Sing sitting down until you need to stand up. Oh, man. There you go. There you go. You got it. You got it. Sing sitting down until you need to stand up. I'm not just talking to her. Right now. That's what we just experienced earlier. Right? So let's see what you like, just, I'm sorry. This wasn't my plan. I'm just stumbling through what I'm supposed to do till I can get to you. Let's do the thing. Okay. You see what's hidden under the surface. You see the beauty under the tarnish. You refine it. What you crumble, you refining fire. What you can't move, find me here in your presence. I'm not leaving the same. Let your refining fire. Purify me again. Wow. Let the weight of your glory bring me back to my knees. Oh, God, come with revival. 
You can start it with me. Yeah, okay. Well, wow. <sighs> what? Wow. What the deal? So listen, um, so is there something more to us cracking that I don't know about right now? Is there something else going on in your story right now that I don't know about? I feel like there's... So on Friday night, I went to the ER because I was pregnant, and the ER told me that I had lost the baby. So I went home and went through all the motions of it, and then I got really sick, and I couldn't hold down fluids, so we went back to the ER because I was just vomiting everything I drank. And they did an ultr another ultrasound, and it turns out I was having twins, and I only lost one baby, and they couldn't find the other. And I just feel like in a five-day period, I went from death to life, and even though I f still feel the sadness of losing one, I only thought I had one, and I just, I feel so blessed that God restored that for me because when that happened, I was upset and emotional, but I still chose to focus on God, mm. and I just feel like this was his way of seeing me through this. And this is God saying he sees you, and you did what you did in the midst of what's going on, and you caused a room full of people to stand to their feet. Praise God. Wow. Okay. <laughs> Man, I should have waited to the end. All right, so here's what we're going to do. I'm going to tell you some of my story. That is beast mode. I don't even know a song that will. I don't even listen to music, but the, you, there's some, wow. That is wow. Okay. I'm just, good night, everyone. <laughs> so we're laughing at church. We're also emotional. This is cool. God will show up in some ways. What she, the story she just told and the, saying she, the song she just sang, um, you need to receive whatever it is you're supposed to receive out of that. There's something about her story. There's something about what she's been through and then the, the, the joy that she has even in the midst of this that you need to receive. It's probably going to be bigger than whatever I talk about. Actually, it won't because God is He's going to use everything. So when I was seven years old, my grandmother used to force me to go to church, and it was miserable miserable. You don't understand. I'm seven years old. This dude is on stage and he mad at everybody. <laughs> and I thought he was mad because he had some phlegm caught in his throat because he would always try to get it out at the end of the sentence. He'd be like, the Lord said, ah, ah. I'm like, grandma, he need to gargle or something. What is going on? I don't. And my shoes were like three sizes too small. I'm seven years old. My grandmother had this thing called a shoehorn. So if your foot don't fit, now it do. Church lasts six hours. Then we go in the basement, eat a sandwich, and come back up like that was halftime or something. It was miserable. One time I went to church, there was a dead body in the front. Nobody explains to a seven-year-old Michael Jr., this is a funeral, it's not church. I'm thinking, yo, that's how they roll. Like every three weeks or so, they bring a dead body in as an example or something. Dude on stage would yell at us like, we did it. I was like, I don't even know that dude. I don't even know. I asked my grandma, I was like, Grandma, what happened to the man in the box? Her whole explanation. I'm like, what happened to the man in the box? All she said was, he in a better place. I'm like, what kind of box did he live in before? <laughs> this stuff that made no sense to me at all. It was miserable. Dude had a Bible, he kept playing like he was going to throw it at people. Ah, ah. People get scared. Hey, man, hey, man. I realize now they were saying hey, amen. I didn't know. <laughs> I was seven. 14 years old, instead of forcing me to go to church, my grandmother did something different. She asked me if I wanted to go. She asked me if I wanted to go. And I was like, um, no. How, no, Grandma, I'll stay home. How about that? Watch cartoons. I hung out with my friends. We couldn't do very much. We could just watch TV because we were broke. We ain't had no money. I was actually being sponsored by a family from Haiti. I ain't had no money at all. I was... <laughs> Some... <laughs> Somebody just say, that's funny. Let's see if I got this right. Instead of actually laughing, you're just going to announce your reaction? That's how you want to do it? That's like driving down the street, getting cut off in traffic, like, <gasps> the horn. <laughs> I 
I also, me and a friend made a deal around 14 years old that we wouldn't curse anymore. This was a deal. If he heard me curse, he could hit me in the chest as hard as he wanted to and vice versa. Dude could hit really hard, like really hard. So I stopped cursing immediately. <laughs> we played other games too. We played a game called Slug Bug. Remember Slug Bug? If you're from the East Coast, they call it Punch Bug. Here's how the game works. If you see a Volkswagen Bug, you get to hit your friend. Those are all the instructions. <laughs> but in my neighborhood, they would add to the game. You ever play Uppercut Fire Truck? <laughs> what about Minivan Body Slam? You ever play that game? <laughs> it was always one crazy dude in a group who would make up games on the spot, like hitching the throat tall building. <laughs> that don't even rhyme, dude. You hit my esophagus. <laughs> this is a funny word, esophagus. I also noticed around this age, I was struggling with my reading. Like I was struggling with my reading. I knew it before, but I didn't care. But now I'm noticing girls, and I don't want them to know I'm having a hard time reading. I read fine now, by the way, like the signs over the door that say excite. I can read that stuff. <laughs> but I used to struggle with my reading. Like I couldn't sound words out phonetically. It just didn't work that way. My mind would start to scramble to figure out what words were. I would look at words seven different ways. I would look at the font size, the color, the positioning, what's in front of it, what's behind it, how people responded to it. I actually came up with seven different ways to look at a word to determine what that word was. Then I got really good at it. To the point in high school, people didn't know I wasn't really reading. I was just working it out really, really fast. Now as an adult, I read just fine, but I still have this ability to look at words and people and situations seven different ways almost immediately. In fact, it's the primary place that I pull my comedy from. So that very thing from my past that looked like it was a handicap, it seemed as if I was dealt a bad hand. God didn't cause it, but he's used it in preparation for what he has me to do. It's almost as if I was practicing, even though I didn't know I was practicing. Let me say this again so you can hear what I'm saying. That thing from your past, the fact that you never met your dad before, your parents were divorced, you were molested as a child. God did not cause that, but he'll use it in preparation for what he has for you to do. You've been practicing. Maybe you didn't know you were practicing. I'm here to let you know you've been practicing, and for a lot of you guys, it's game time. God didn't cause it, but he'll use it. God did not cause what she went through, but already he's used it in a significant way for everyone in this room and anyone who will watch it. So now, as a result of, uh, of my practice, like I find funny everywhere. It's almost, literally I call it practice. It's almost as if you've been practicing. But from my practice, I find funny all over the place. People ask weird questions. Michael Jr., where are you from originally? Originally, huh. Well, uh, I was conceived in Michigan. Yeah. <laughs> Before that, I was with my dad. Yeah. Um, and, and then there was a swim competition, right? Um, and I won, which is crazy, right? Because currently, I don't swim at all. I mean, I forgot all about how to swim, man. But I used to be fast, man. I was fast. Explain that to the kids later on. Okay, cool. Great. She's like, no, I'm not doing it. I'm waiting until 30. That's awesome. She already know anyway. She's going to explain it to you. That's great. So I would just, I just have this ability because of what I thought was a disability. So 26 years old, I moved to New York City. The reason I moved to New York City is because I want to know if I'm funny. In New York, if you're not funny, the way they let you know is they'll say something like, you're not funny. <laughs> Period. That's just flat out what they'll say. So there's a comedy club in New York called the Comic Strip Live. It's one of the best clubs in New York City. The club is so hard to get into, they have open mics on Tuesday nights around 7.30 p.m. Comedians who are new in town, like myself, start lining up at 6 o'clock in the morning so they can get their name drawn out of a hat in hopes that they can do 90 seconds to three minutes in front of the manager. It's really hard to get into this club. It's finally my turn to perform at the Comic Strip Live, and right before I get ready to get on stage, a comedian named George Wallace walks in. Now, George Wallace is very established, which means whoever's next gets bumped. I know I'm about to get bumped, but no, this is where God shows up for the first time in my life. Well, this is where I noticed him. So the manager's walking over to him. He's like, hey, Michael, listen, George Wallace is here. Do you want to go before him or after him? That never happens. You never get an option. I was like, before him, please. <laughs> so I'm going before George Wallace, and I got New Yorkers laughing. Not only are they laughing, he comes in. And he's laughing as well. And he says, and, he, and then after the show, there's a bunch of comedians around him asking him questions. He leaves them and he walks over to me. And he says, you know what? You're really funny. I was like, wow, thanks, man. He said, and you're clean. He said, let me ask you a question. He said, why don't you curse? I was like, I don't know. What if my grandmother walk in or something? 
My grandmother wasn't coming to New York or a comedy club. What else was I going to say? My friend might hit me in the chest. I'm a grown man. So I said, you're funny, you're clean. I'd like for you to do a show with me and my best friend in a couple nights. I didn't even know who his best friend was. I get to the show. It's me, George Wallace, Jerry Seinfeld. We do two shows. I got two stand ovations. I rip. I'm the man. I'm like, yes. After the show, the club manager walks up to me. And he says to me, hey, Michael, you had a great set. Let me ask you a question. Would you like to go to church with me tomorrow? I was like, church, man, back up. You're making my feet hurt, man. I don't go to church. What do I go to church for? No. I was like, no, nah, I'm cool, man. Thanks for, thanks for offering. And then 20 minutes later, his fiance, who was fine, <laughs> talk about beautiful. She asked me the same question, but she was beautiful. She had some sort of accent. She was like, Michael Jr., would you like to go to church with us? I was like, I was just looking for a church the other day, man. Find me a church. So I go to this church for the wrong reasons, and I can't even find these people, and I'm sitting in the back. And this dude comes out on stage, and he's talking about Jesus, like your pastor. He's just talking about Jesus. He's not screaming. He's not yelling. He don't got no perm. Dude, just talking about Jesus. <laughs> then he did this thing where you're like an altar call. He said, if you want Jesus in your life, all you have to do is believe in your heart, confess in your, with your mouth, and Jesus is yours. And I wanted to do it. Like, see, like, for real, I really, really wanted to. But I was like, nah, I got to read the pamphlet first. Because I knew a couple of Christians, and they were creepy. There's some creepy Christians out there. If you don't know any creepy Christians, it's you. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Your friends know one. Yeah, yeah. Or should I say your friend? <laughs> you just got that one friend. Your friend's name is Mama. <laughs> so I told myself, nah, I, I, before I do it, I'm going to read the Bible first. I even have a Bible. A few days later, this lady walks up to me at a mall or airport or something, just hands me a Bible. We never exchanged words. She just handed me a Bible. I was like, snap. First of all, I didn't know it was that big. The thing is huge. I said I was going to read this before I gave my life to Jesus, so I'm reading the Bible. And the first thing I read was the copyrights. The Bible was made in Grand Rapids, Michigan. I'm like, snap, me too. That's crazy, man. That's where I was. <laughs> so, I'm, so I read this Bible, and I get to, I'm reading, and I'm going to church, and I'm digging into God's word now because I really want to give my life over to Jesus. Now, you don't have to read the Bible first by any means. I just wanted to stick to what I said. So I'm putting in like 12 to maybe 14 hours a day reading the Bible. All I'm doing is hitting comedy clubs, reading the Bible, going to church. So 12 to 14 hours a day. That was like a chapter a day. Like I was digging in. I'm just playing. I read faster than that. It actually took me 36 days to read the Bible. I remember finished reading the Bible. I remember getting to the part of Matthew where it said Jesus died for me. I did not know that Jesus died for me until I was... 27 years old. I had a birthday in January. I did not know that Jesus died for me until I read it right there in Matthew. I had no idea. I got to know. Then I turned to Mark and he died again. I'm like, what in the world? And then Luke and then John, I'm like, why are you going back in the garden, Jesus? For real. I thought Jesus died four times. I'm like, well, this dude keep going back. I don't understand why. And now, and then I finish reading, and I give my life to Jesus. I do this thing, because at, at the church, they would do this thing where you raise your hand, and you do this prayer, you stand up, and, it's, and Jesus is yours. And I, and I did it, and I was excited. I was like, it, now I understand. I used to just think I was funny. Now I understand I'm funny for a reason. God has a purpose for my sense of humor, and he can even use the setbacks that I've had. He can even use the setbacks that you've had for his glory and to amplify your story. So now I get some celebrities, some that you would know who ask me questions about God. And they'll say stuff like, explain God to me. First of all, I can't just explain God. Like, if I could just explain him, he wouldn't be God, it would be me. And I'm not God. I just want to throw that out there real quick. <laughs> Remember that dude in Texas who said he was God? Remember he said he was Jesus? It was a dude in Texas back in the day. He was, dude said he was Jesus. He had followers and everything. This was before Twitter. Like, he had followers. Dude was Jesus. I pulled up a picture of him. He had... The dude wore glasses. You can't be Jesus and have an optometrist. Like, you can't do both. Like, so you healed the blind, then you went and picked up your bifocals. Is that what you did? Like, I just don't understand that. So celebrities asked me questions about God. Like, one dude said to me, some, some celebrities that you would know, this guy said, how is it that I can do all of the stuff that I'm doing, and you still tell me God wants a relationship with me? And this is all I could come up with. And it wasn't, this isn't even close to how awesome God is, but at the time, this is all I could come up with. I was like, God is kind of like a navigation device when you're in your car. 
You ever been in a car with a navigation device before? You ever been in a car before? We can start there. You guys ever been in a car? Okay. It's like being in a car with a navigation device. If it says go 10 blocks and turn left, then you go 10 blocks and turn right. It doesn't abandon what you're supposed to do. It recalculates what you need to do to get to where you're supposed to be based upon where you are. The only problem is if you keep making the wrong turns, the road conditions will be different. They may be rougher and you're running out of time. So you have to be sensitive to listen to that voice so you can make the right choice about what you're supposed to do. And that voice sounds an awful lot like a coach because you haven't been practicing for nothing. It's game time. So now um, I leave New York City because it's expensive. I was paying $750 a month for a couch. <laughs> Not a whole apartment. It was just a, it was a sliver of an apartment. I had to be on the couch. That was my whole apartment right there. So it was expensive. So I move from New York to Los Angeles because my cousin has a free couch that I could sleep on. So in Los Angeles, there's a comedy club called the Comedy and Magic Club, the greatest comedy club in the country. I know you guys have crackers here, which is awesome, which I remember back in the day, I used to talk about Crackers Comedy Club because uh, this is one of the jokes I would do at the Crackers. I would be like, you know what? This whole area, Indiana just makes so much sense because you guys got libraries and they got books. You got a hamburger place, they got burgers, and you got crackers. <laughs> anyway, I'm not going to explain that part. I guess I don't... <laughs> You just got that just now, sir? I just heard you just now. He's like, ha, ha, ha. Oh, he called me a cracker, didn't he? Yes, yes, yes. Anyway. <laughs> so. Oh, snap. That took a while. <laughs> so George Wallace calls me up and says, hey, you want to go to the Comedy Magic Club? And he takes me to this prestigious club that normally I couldn't even physically get into. He can't get me on stage, but at least he got me into the club. So he... But not only does he take me into the club, he then, at the end of the show, takes me into the green room. And there's some soldiers in comedy in the green room. There's George Wallace, Gary Shanley, Jay Leno. I'm brand new in town, and suddenly I'm in the presence of these soldiers in comedy, and I'm sitting back there. I'm just happy to be sharing French fries with these dudes. And the reason I was only eating fries, even though they had this huge spread of food and I was very hungry, I didn't feel like I contributed to anything at all, so I was just eating fries. I was nibbling on, like, two fries. And at the time, they were working on a joke about a football player who got hit in the eye with a flag. Some of you guys may remember this. He got hit in the eye with a flag, and he was suing the league for like $400 million. Now, all of these guys are helping Leno with that joke for the monologue on The Tonight Show. I ain't saying nothing. I'm just happy to be in a room nibbling on fries with these dudes. But then they got, but your gift will make room for you. They got quiet, and they all looked at me. And I was like, oh, snap. This is an opportunity. I was like, all right, let me see if I got this right. He got hit in the eye with a flag. He lost his vision in one eye, and he's suing the league for $400 million. Um, he not going to see half of it. <laughs> then I grabbed a piece of chicken. <laughs> I just, I just, I just. <laughs> Here's the thing. How did I get that joke that fast under that much pressure? The truth is, it wasn't as much pressure as you might think, because I'd been practicing since I was a child in the form of a kid who was struggling with his reading. I was practicing just like you've been practicing. Maybe you didn't know you were practicing. I'm here right now to let you know you've been practicing and that God cares about you. And for a lot of you guys, it is game time. But you have to be able to hear the coach's voice. Um, Hey, so when you leave here today, by the way, before I forget, there's two things that's going on that I, got, that I have going on. I have a course that I created that uses comedy to help you understand what to do with regards to understanding your purpose. So people in the room who probably don't know exactly what they should be, like you're like, ah, I like this. One key is you shouldn't ask, what do I want to do? You should ask the question, who do I want to serve? Anyway, we created a course that you can get when you leave here. It's right outside. It comes with a really Awesome layout. You can do it with your friends. You can do it with your spouse, whatever the case is. Anyway, that's available out there. The other thing that we're doing this afternoon uh, is I have a nonprofit called Funny for the Forgotten, where we go to homeless shelters and prisons and abuse children's facilities. So we're going to a woman's prison when I leave here, and we're going to do some comedy there. Um, why are you going to a woman's prison? It's a captive audience. Um, <laughs> so we're going to be going there. I, for I forget the name of the prison, but... Um, Anyway, we're going there after this, so if you guys want to, uh, if 
you want to come to the women's prison with us, you just got to hurry up and commit a crime or something. And you got to be a woman, I guess. But the nonprofit is funny for the forgotten. My first time ever in prison, I was very afraid. The reason I was so afraid is because I'd never been in a prison. Like, I was scared. And as soon as I walk in, the warden takes my belt from me. He's like, you can't have a belt. Somebody might try to hang you. Can't they just boo me like regular people? That's why they in here right now. So I'm, I'm afraid, for real. I'm in prison, my pants loose. Like, this is just a bad idea, man. <laughs> I got seven different ways to look at this, man. I'm scared. I'm walking in, right? I'm walking in, and I don't got no belt. In the, and I don't know what I'm going to do, right? But, and, and I got a bunch of guards around me, so I'm okay. But then as we get deeper into the prison, these guards start falling off like somebody's shooting with arrows or something. At the end, I got two guards with me. They're like, this is as far as we go. I was like, me too, man. You better give him a DVD or something. I ain't going in there. <laughs> but God told me to go in. So I go in here, and there's all these prisoners. There's no glass. I'm like, there's no stage, no glass. We're not doing comedy on the phone. These cats are all right here in a big circle expecting me to bring the funny. And I'm looking. I'm doing the math on a joke, and nothing is popping up. Seven different ways to nothing. I look cool on the outside as I walk and approach to my spot where I'm supposed to land. And there's, a, there's like a, all of the prisoners are all in this big circle kind of sitting on the floor, and then there's a hole in the middle of the circle where I'm supposed to do comedy. I got three steps left before I, gotta, before I land, and I got to bring the funny. Probably got two and a half seconds before I need to start talking before they know I got nothing, and I don't know what's going to happen. But I literally have nothing. I'm walking in. I got nothing. I got nothing. I, I lift this foot up, and I settle it, and for real, sitting right up front is a white dude with a white beard named Moses. I was like, thanks, Lord. When I saw, when I saw Moses... When I said these words, the place exploded in laughter. We had an amazing time. I said, Moses, this is what I want you to do. When you see the prison warden, I want you to look him in his eye. You look him right in his eye, and I want you to say, let my people go. <laughs> How did I get that joke that fast under that much pressure? It wasn't a lot of pressure because I've been practicing. Just like you've been practicing, but you have to be able to hear the coach's voice. You have to be able to hear the coach's voice. You have to get close to the coach and stay close. Who goes through what she went through in the emergency room and then says, all right, let's go to church? That's how you get to the place where you can hear the coach's voice. So me and my wife were looking at some old home videos recently. It wasn't super old. It wasn't like a VHS. Some of the young people were like, what's the hush?" I don't know what the Vahush is, and why was he swimming, and now he can't? <laughs> Work it out when you get home. So we're looking at these old home videos, and we came across a video of our youngest daughter being born. And I'm going to show you this video. It's not her being born, because that's not the video to show in church, especially if my wife wants to, she should be upset if I showed it. Let's just say that. So let me set it up for you. I took this video. The video you're about to watch, I took the video, but I never understood the power of it until I watched the video. So, as I, so my daughter at this point is like two and a half minutes old, and they got her under that little chicken warmer, the little, the little thing that keeps the french fries warm. At the, I don't know what kind of insurance we have, but that's what they got her under. I'm just... So they got her under a little chicken warmer, and, um, and she starts to cry. That's not her. That's amazing. I don't know. She's, she's way older now. That was, that was on cue. You... Oh, the baby crying. I'm sure you got a nipple or something. You can get a baby, right? You got a nipple? A binky? <laughs> Did you just reach for yours? He was like, I got one. Bling. It's okay. It, she'll blend in perfectly with the video. It's going to work out great. So, so she's two and a half minutes old. She starts, to, she starts to, to cry. I want you to notice what happens when she hears my voice. Okay, Portland, look, I'm right here. It's okay, it's okay. I'm right here, I'm right here. We're doing just fine. It's okay, it's okay, I'm right here. Right here, yeah, it's okay. It's okay, baby. Yo, that was pretty powerful. Like, she just stopped crying, as did the little white baby over there. That is amazing. I just want to point to that. That's, that's pretty a dog with amazing. <laughs> now, it's like seven, maybe seven and a half minutes or so later, and the nurse is done cleaning her up, and she starts to cry again. I speak up, and she stops crying again. But I want you to notice what happens when I tell her I love her. 
Portland, it's okay. It's okay. It's good. It's good. It's good. I'm right here. I'm right here. I am right here. I love you. I love you. I love you. Yeah, I'm right here. I'm right here. It's okay. It's okay. So here's the thing. There's going to be times in life for most people where you feel like you've just been practicing and practicing and practicing. And maybe you're even frustrated, even to the point of tears. The key thing to do in those moments is to be still and listen for the Father's voice. Because he is talking to you. And what he wants you to know is that he's right here. He loves you. He cares about you. All you have to do is open your eyes. You hear some music? Yeah, not yet, man. You early again. You early again. It's not your concert. It's not your concert. You just got to wait. You're way too early. You're getting us all emotional. I'm like, is that my heart singing right now? Nope, it's you back there. That dude is smooth. That is... That's Doug, everybody. Past tense of dig. He's just a little early. So I got one more story I need to tell before this dude slides his smooth self in right now. So before I tell this story, first I want to tell you how I came up with this story. And then after I tell you how I came up with it, then past tense of dig is supposed to slide in right there. So the way I came up with this story is I was writing a joke. I was writing a joke about the good room. How many people in this room, how many of you guys know what the good room is? Raise your hand if you know what the good room is. So there's like no hands going up. The truth is, is mostly all of you know what the good room is. I just never finished writing a joke. Let me explain what the good room is. The good room is that room in your grandmother's house or your aunt's house, or maybe your house. It's that one room that's better than the rest of the house. Okay, nobody going there, there's plastic on the furniture, the china's located there. It's really just for looks. How many people know what the good room is now? Raise your hand. Exactly, so I'm writing this joke about the good room, and in the middle of writing this joke, God stopped me and told me to tell this story to his people instead of writing a joke. So that's what I'm gonna do, I'm gonna tell you the story. Right now would be a great time to slide in. <laughs> That'd be awesome, man. Dude. Early and late. Wow. Amazing. So this is a story about having a relationship with Jesus. So I want everyone in here, even those watching online, I want you to imagine, imagine that you are a house. And outside of the house, God bless you, and outside of the house is Jesus Christ, and he wants to come in. But he'll never force his way in. He actually wants you to invite him in. And the reason some people in here right now haven't invited Jesus into the house, because you're cool with the way things are right now. Whenever you need something, you just walk up to the door, crack it open, say what you need, say a little prayer, tell him what happened, then close the door and come back into the house. But that's not a relationship at all. How can you hear his voice under those circumstances? How can you utilize the practice under those circumstances? And the reason you won't let him into the house is because your house is a mess. And you think you need to clean it up first. How's that working out for you? There may be drugs or pornography in the house. Or you're just watching a bunch of TV to be distracted from the mess. Or relationships. You brought other people in the house hoping that maybe somehow they could help you get it right. But they can't. The only one who can truly help you clean the house is standing outside the door wearing an apron with a bucket in his hand waiting on you to truly open the door. Then there's other people in here right now. You used to have Jesus in the whole house, but whether you realize it or not, you've moved him to just one room in the house. The good room. Have you ever noticed how the good room most of the time is the one right up front with the big window? So when people look in, they think the whole house is clean. But it's not, it's just that one room. So when they hear about you coming to church, they think the whole house is clean. But it's not, it's just that one room. You give money, but it's just that one room. You quote scriptures, but it's just that one room. You pray, but it's just that one room. Jesus wants access to the whole house. And I'm telling you, if you would just open this door and let him in, he'll show up with a contractor named the Holy Spirit. And they'll make sure the house is fully functioning the way it was intended to. 
But none of this happens if you don't open the door. Because he will not, he will never force his way in. He wants you to invite him in. So if everyone in here, if you could just close your eyes and bow your head. The reason I ask you to do this is so you can have a private moment where no one's looking around. If you're in here right now and you need to invite Jesus into your house, you know this is really about you right now. You need to invite Jesus into your house, whether it be for the first time or to give him full access to the house. I'm going to ask you to do something really simple. On the count of three, I just simply want you to put your hand in the air. You don't have to overthink this. If you need to make this decision for the first time or to fully give him access to the house, on the count of three, just simply put your hand in the air. There's hands already going up. One, two, three, nice and high. Praise God, praise God, praise God, praise God. All right, go ahead, put your hand down. And then look up at me. So here's what happens more times than not. Let me say this first. I am proud of you. Now, more times than not, when I think of that phrase and saying it to an audience, God will give me a number of how many times I need to re-say that phrase so some people in the room can receive it because you haven't done so from a father's voice before. You haven't received that phrase from a father's voice. So I'm going to repeat it again that number of times, and I simply want you to work on receiving it from a father's voice. I am proud of you. 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 You know what's funny is the baby in the back crying right now represents what's going on in some people's hearts right now. I'm proud of you. I am 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 proud of you. So now I'm actually to do something else. This is for everyone who raised their hand and even those who should have raised their hand. Jesus says, if you would take a stand for me before man, I will take a stand for you before my Father in heaven. So what that's going to look like right here on earth, right here in this room, is everyone who raised their hand, and even those who should have raised their hand, on the count of three, I'm going to ask you to stand to your feet and remain standing so we can pray together. This is very important. If you can't take the stand in here where we're proud of you, you won't be able to do it out there if they're not. So again, this is for everyone who raised their hand and even those who should have raised their hand. On the count of three, I want you to stand up and remain standing so we can pray together. When you raise your hand, you were blowing a door open. When you raise your hand, you were basically reaching for the doorknob. But when you stand up and we do this prayer, you're blowing the door open so Jesus can come into the house. So again, this is for everyone who raised their hand and even those who should have raised their hand. On the count of three, I want you to stand up and remain standing. And to help with that, everyone around you, they're going to applaud as loud as they can. But it will not compare to the applause that the angels in heaven will be doing when you stand to your feet and remain standing. One, two, three. Just stand up and remain standing. Stand up and remain standing. Awesome. If you're standing up, don't clap. Just receive the applause of the people around you. Just receive the applause of the people around you. Just receive the applause of the people around you. Praise God, praise God, praise God, praise God, praise God. All right, so here's what we're gonna do. Keep, keep standing, keep standing, keep standing. Here's what we're gonna do, we're gonna do a prayer. We're gonna pray, and I want you to pray this prayer in the privacy of your heart and receive Jesus when I do this prayer. Then when we're done with the prayer, um, they normally bring up a white dude to make it official. There he is, lurking in the back. He's just right there, just, I'm gonna make this, I'm gonna make it official, just to, I don't know why that's my white guy's voice. Listen, we're laughing in the middle of a life-changing moment. God wants you to laugh. He wants you to have joy. He created it for you. Anything outside of him that causes you to laugh is a counterfeit. See, even the baby got it. So I want you to repeat after me in the privacy of your heart. Repeat this prayer in the privacy of your heart. Dear God, Thank you for sending your son, Jesus Christ, to this earth to die for me. Thank you that he rose again on the third day. And thank you for forgiving me for all my sins, for every sin. I believe it and I receive it. Come into my house and come into my heart. 
and have your way. Thank you, Father. In Jesus' name, amen. Wow, you guys are doggone amazing. You allowing me to be a part of this decision? Man, okay, I'm gonna just go. You guys are awesome. I love you, I love you, I love you. Thank you so much. Here comes your white guy. Give yourselves a round of applause. Thank you so much.